Welcome to the New Books Network. Welcome in, everyone. My name is John Yargo, and today's guest is Alice Daly, whose book, How to Do Things with Dead People, History, Technology, and Temporality, From Shakespeare to Warhol, was published through Cornell University Press in May 2022. Daly is professor of English at Villanova University and is the author of the previous monograph, The English Martyr from Reformation to Revolution from Notre Dame Press. How to Do Things with Dead People is a study of the representational strategies taken up to explore the porous boundary between past and present and dead and undead in Shakespeare's history plays. Daly draws on Roland Barthes, Susan Sontag, Lee Edelman, Peggy Phelan, and Derrida, but this book is not a series of Barthesian, Sontagian, Fellanian, and Derridian readings of early modern drama. Instead, Daly creates new space for how we might think about the unruly interrelationships of the present, the past, and the future, including how 20th century technology can reanimate our engagement with early modern theories of kingship, ableism, and reproductive futurity. Welcome to the show, Alice. Thanks so much for having me, John, and thanks for that terrific description of the project. I appreciate that. Sure. Um, First question, um, can you discuss the evolution of this project? Did you begin with the goal of writing a book about the history plays, and did you know from the start that you would draw on, say, 20th century theoretical writing about photography? Um, I did know that I was going to be, I I sort of began to write a book about the history plays. um, And that was really all I knew at the beginning, that I was um, fascinated by them, namely um, because of a, um, a series of productions that I saw in 2008 at the Royal Shakespeare Company. Um, Michael Boyd directed the full eight play group. Um, And I saw them performed over a four day weekend um, in Stratford by us. It was a single company did all 265 or so parts. Um, So it was really a tremendous experience. And um, I came away from that knowing that my second book would be about the history plays. Um, The rest of it just sort of evolved gradually. And um, it evolved in part out of a different project that that um, was a space in which I came to develop the methodology that this book um, uses. Um, And that project was uh, an article on um, an exhibition at the National Gallery in London in 2013 um, by conceptual artist Michael Landy. So Landy was a fellow at the National Gallery and Um, He had a couple years to hang out there and do something. And what he ended up doing was um, taking apart, really, and then putting back together um, medieval and Renaissance iconography, paintings mainly about martyrs and martyrdom. And that's the subject of my first book. So um, he both created uh, elaborate collages of this, these taken apart paintings, and also um, created three-dimensional operational self-destroying martyr sculptures out of pieces from the collection. So he would take an arm from a painting, have it fabricated into um, an operational, you know, three-dimensional object and um, spring load it with a button. And then um, the visitor to the gallery could push the button and it would make the arm poke a hole in the torso of Christ in the manner of Doubting Thomas. Um, So I read about this. I decided I had to go and see it. I went and sat in the gallery for a couple of days in London and watched people push the buttons and um, wander around. And I came away from that feeling that I understood martyrology in a way that my own book on martyrology didn't quite understand. And so that project and is sort of just allowing myself from there to um, use art to think 
um, use art to think about literature and not art that was contemporaneous with the literature, but art that itself was thinking about literature, that that was for me a really productive way to understand the texts that were my primary area of interest. Um, so I came out of the Saints Alive project with the confidence that I could do that successfully and also with a sense that um it was going to be a really productive way of bringing together different interests I have, but different idioms through which human beings think and um, represent and produce objects for our own consideration and consumption. Um, so I, I would not say, to go back to your question, that I knew that I would be using photographic theory, for example, to think about the history plays, but I did know that I was open to using almost anything. Um, and so I began to go to, I went to an exhibition at the Guggenheim called Haunted. And it was about memory and representation. And I saw there really, I think probably for the first time in person, um, Warhol's electric chair paintings and had the, wow, that looks like a throne thought and the book kind of um, emerged out of, out of that and out of the methodology that I had developed in, um, in the Landy project. Yes, thank you. Um, would you constellate the scholarship that you're engaging with? What does the critical landscape that you inherited look like? Which scholars do you consider important precursors to the work you're doing? And who are you sparring with here? Yes. Um, so I would say I'm sparring less with a who than a what. Um, the, this project is a full-throated um, um, response um, and a rejection in many ways of the limitations of historicism. Um, historicism was already um, orthodoxy, critical orthodoxy by the time I entered graduate school. It was, um, in my understanding, the way to um, produce oneself as a legitimate scholar. Um, it was the way to signal on the job market um, that one was serious and um, capable. Um, and I, I, it was never what I wanted to do. Um, and so, thankfully, I had in graduate school a, a really terrific mentor, Lowell Gallagher at UCLA, um, who helped me think other ways. Um, but I, um, after tenure in my first book, became, I guess, really resistant and unwilling um, to continue producing that methodology when I thought there were so many things we could be doing that um, would engage more directly with our colleagues in other fields, um, with um, the, the media um, that's being produced now, much of which it resonates to me with the media that was being produced in early modern England. Um, and so I was frustrated by, by the, the way that our field framed critical legitimacy as historicist practice. And I was interested in trying to open that up. Um, and so this book is a reaction to the constraints and conservatism of the discipline as I inherited it. Um, and it's an attempt to um, enable um, new forms of scholarly thinking about early modern literature. Um, so that's sort of its principal um, position um, in the field. Um, in terms of scholarship that I'm engaging with, um, the book is, as you've said, primarily on the histories, um, but it's interested in um, a bunch of questions that really transcend not just Shakespearean drama and historical drama, but disciplines and periods. Um, and those interests have to do with death and with replica production. Um, so as I think about history as a form of replica production, um, that opens up 
a whole range of disciplines and periods and thinkers that I then am able to set early modern studies in conversation with. So those um, thinkers include scholars from performance theory, from media studies, visual studies, art history, from queer and crip theory, from bioethics and philosophy. So a wide range of disciplines um, where thinking about replica production is a fairly standard um, kind of critical move. Um, And who think about replica production in ways that resonate with the the kinds of thinking that I want to do. So I see this work as um, bringing some of those fields into early modern studies, ideally, but also, I hope, um, setting early modern studies in vital conversation with fields who might be interested in what we have to say and what we do in early modern studies. Um, The... Scholars who are have been most important to this work. Um, the first is Phyllis Racken, whose book Stages of History in 1990 um, has been the seminal work on the history plays since its publication, um, and for good reason. It's terrific and um, transformative, I think, for our thinking about the history plays. Um, it was it's so good <laughs> that when I first started to work on this material, I was almost disabled by how terrific that book is. And I think one of the reasons there hasn't been a great deal of um, scholarship on the hit or monographs, I guess, on the history plays since then is because it's just so terrific. Um, but over time, I, I began to see that um its terrificness, which is not a word, but um, what could be an enabling um, sort of generative feature that because it's so good, I had to really think outside of the paradigms that Racken so persuasively sets up um, and enter conversation about the history play from plays from a very different angle. And so ultimately, um, the fact that that book is so good um, helped me to write a book that's very different um, and different, not just from that book, but from a, a lot of the book that a lot of the work that goes on in our field. Um, so Racken's book um, was really key for me. And then um, I have worked quite a bit with performance studies and performance theory, N- not necessarily because this book is a performance theory book. It uses performance theory in lots of ways, but performance studies is a field that has as at its kind of generative core um, feminism. And so thinkers like Peggy Phelan, Rebecca Schneider, Diana Taylor um, have been for me models for thinking with and through affect um, in ways that early modern studies um, has not fully embraced, um, but also for thinking against the hegemony of archives, um, thinking against the assumption that archives are hermeneutically stable and performance is not. Um, And so those scholars have given me um, thinking paradigms for coming to what I see and read um, with a sort of different set of assumptions or, or um, letting go of the assumptions that, that I inherited and was taught. So I'm, I'm deeply indebted to them. Um, I am in conversation in this book with um, Alison Kafer's Feminist Queer Crip, which has been a really important book for me, um, and with queer theorists in early modern studies, but also in in the field of field of queer studies um, more generally. Um, and I think I would say finally that I, I hope that I am thinking with artists, that it's really important to me um, intellectually to be in conversation with art and artists. Um, And that influences some of what I do as a writer, but um, ultimately I, I see the work of artists as really a vital part of the way that I, um, I want to engage with my own field. And so they are interlocutors for me, um, even if they speak in the book 
through through visual um, work rather than through criticism. I do think that it comes across powerfully in the book. Um, oh, for good. Sure. I'm so glad to hear that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'm sort of deeply interested in the prose of academic writing. And I appreciate the way you can write about very dense theory with authority, but always with prose that is nimble, graceful, and and a pleasure to read, really. Um, Would you feel comfortable reading a passage from your book? Yeah. Um, I will read um, the second full paragraph of, of the, um, of the introduction to the book, which um, is generated out of a quotation um, from Agamben's potentiality. So I'll start with the Agamben quotation and then move into my paragraph. Um, So this is from Melville's essay on Bartleby, I'm sorry, from um, Agamben's essay on Melville's Bartleby the Scrivener. Agamben writes, What shows itself on the threshold between being and non-being, between sensible and intelligible, between word and thing, is not the colorless abyss of the nothing, but the luminous spiral of the possible. How to do things with dead people tarries in the luminous spiral, arguing that Shakespeare constitutes history at the threshold of possibility between dead and alive, object and subject, and that his histories occupy this threshold with a multitude of other reproductive technologies that my study only begins to address. Although some of the technologies that this book sets in conversation with the history plays are conventionally associated with specific mechanical devices, such as the still camera or x-ray machine, I show how such technologies generate and depict phenomena that are not chronologically confined. Shakespeare's histories contain photographic selfies and x-ray images, just as the glitchy machinery of the electric chair mirrors the reproductive operations of the play's English throne. The throne and the electric chair share conceptual infrastructures that transcend the specific chronologies of technical innovation attending either apparatus. To observe such infrastructures at work and to generate conversation among them, as this book does, is therefore neither a historicist nor a presentist project, because those infrastructures cannot be properly located in either the past or the present. Identifying the common underlying phenomena that such technologies reproduce enables movement beyond distinct histories of literary production or mechanical innovation. Such work opens a transhistorical, intermedial conversation about the generative forms, ontological questions, and representational aesthetics that collect around the undead dead. Thank you. Um, I'd like to talk about the style a little bit. And I think um, one of the powerful things about this this passage is the way still camera and x-ray machine sort of um, announce themselves and then you persuasively over the course of the book um, make a compelling case for for why their um, invitations to rethink um, Shakespeare's chronicle plays. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, what uh, the process of writing this and some of the choices that you made? Yes. Um, so if you're going to write a book about um Shakespeare's history plays and ventriloquist dummies and electric chairs and cloning um, and the range of other um, technologies that the book explores. Um, I guess you just got to own that, right? Um, so part of what the the opening of this book does is to own that and to own the, uh, as I put it in the, the very beginning of the book, the strangeness of that um, and the purpose of that strangeness, which is to enable forms of thinking that are disabled by more conventional modes of study. Um, so as a stylist, uh, I'm trying, and I, this is something I talk to my students about regularly, I'm trying to tell the truth. I'm trying to own um, what it is that I'm doing and um, what I believe um, and to own to the passion that I bring to my intellectual life um, and to allow that to speak um, 
in my academic prose. Um, so that those are sort of um, some of the priorities that animate um, a paragraph like this one. I also, I guess, um, you know, we have a habit, I think, as critics to use phrases like the ways in which. Um, and I decided pretty early on in my scholarly career, I, I want, I hope, I, I believe, um, but I'm not positive, that I banished that phrase from my first book, that I was able to get rid of it completely. Um, and so that has been kind of a, a helpful um, rule um, that has guided other, I, I think, habits of directness that um, have become part of my my writing practice. And maybe we can spend time as well just unspooling the arguments in those sure. in that passage. Um, and, and what strikes you as um, the, the main contribution of your book? Yeah, so um, what this do- book does principally is to think about the history plays, uh, as I suggest in that paragraph and elsewhere, um, in the context of a whole very broad range of um, ways that human beings interact with and represent um, the dead. Um, and so as I explored the, the plays in those terms, and particularly as, as I thought about them um, as plays in which we don't just resurrect the dead, but kill them off again, um, I developed a, way, uh, a, um, a vocabulary and, and a sort of conceptual frame um, for including um, technologies that do that, such as capital punishment machinery. Um, so this book argues that um, there are um, conceptual sort of undercurrents that animate a number of technologies that span um, time periods and purposes, aesthetic registers, um, and media um, but that share uh, um, uh, what I describe here as a conceptual infrastructure, that they work from a shared set of assumptions and necessities um, that we can excavate if we um, consider them sort of at a a level beneath um, historical specificity or mechanical innovation. So for example, if we think about the still camera, we, we often, the sort of conventional wisdom about that is that the still camera um, ushered in a way of seeing um, and made available to us modes of seeing that were not previously available. So one of the things I argue about Richard II is that the mode of seeing, the wish to see, the fantasy to see in the way that still cameras made possible pre-existed the camera itself, that the camera um, as a technology, as a mechanical device um, emerges out of a wish to see that is being expressed and explored um, and realized, I would argue, in non- photographic means um, and it, in other uh, media like drama prior to the development of that actual mechanism so that we can disentangle the camera as a mechanical device from the camera's way of seeing and and notice that that way of seeing um, precedes the device itself and that that gives us then ways of thinking about how does Richard II see himself and what kinds of technologies is he using to think about himself as a live person, as a dead person, as a future dead person, um, et cetera. So this is the kind of work that the book does, is to, to try to um, move beyond the history of the mechanical device to look at um, human impulses to see and represent and how those impulses express themselves in a range of media that are not um, period specific. I like that. It's almost like technology um, has to inhabit an imaginative niche that that necessarily precedes it, you know? Right. We have to want it before we can build it. Um, And I think part of what this book argues is that we want it long before we can build it sometimes. And that even once we've built it, we continue to want it and to produce 
other versions of it, even though we have um, one version in place. So, for example, if I can give an example that um, the, you know, I argue that that historical drama is a kind of double exposure because um, it uses a living body to represent a dead body. So we see simultaneously the living body of the actor and um, the dead person who is being performed through that body, who's being represented by that body. So if that's double exposure, if that's a kind of dramatic double exposure, then double exposure as a photographic technology, which doesn't emerge until the 19th century, is a, a realization of an impulse um, and a media that has been happening in historical drama for centuries prior to that. Then when we get to a technology like cloning, um, which is another, I would argue, form of double exposure, we are both replicating um, the prior technology of photographic double exposure, realizing it differently, and doing something that's already happening in the history plays. So that's the kind, again, sort of the kind of argument um, that the that the book works with. Yes, yeah. In your uh, second chapter, you, you talk about um, ghosts. You yeah. know, right? The way um, these sort of early photographs captured what seemed like spectral v- guests, visitors. Um, and and um, to quote your introduction, um, ghostly double exposures generate a visual field in which figures in different metaphysical states are made to occupy a single space and time. Um, can you bring that to bear on um, Henry four parts one and two, which is what that uh, chapter engages with and, and maybe specific scenes in those plays? Sure. Um that so that chapter, um, the chapter on double exposure, um, actually grew out of the image that's on the cover of the book, which is um, a photograph of an X-ray of a sculpture held in the Getty Museum's um, antiquities collection. It's a photograph by um, David Maisel, and. Um, that was one of the sort of early germs of this whole project was that photo, the photo that's on the cover of the book. Um, and it, it, the reason it was generative for me um, had to do with the way that it, it, um, comp- it superimposes multiple media. So a sculpture and an x-ray and a photograph. Um, and those media are co-located with one another in that image um, and therefore can be thought of as multiple kinds as like the image of it is itself intermedial. Um, but also because of the temporal effects that it generates. And so I became interested in the temporal effects of an X-ray. Um, and the chapter you're referring to on Henry IV works with the first X-ray, um, which was um, an X-ray of a woman's hand. Her name is Anna Bertha Ronken, and she was the wife of the man who developed the X-ray, Wilhelm Ronken. Um, And when she saw this image of her X-rayed hand, the first ever X-ray, what she said was, "I," or what she's reputed to have said, is, I have seen my death. Um, So what she's observing there is the way in which an image of the past, an image of her hand on the photographic plate um, is returning to her as an image of the future. So it's like the Maisel um, photograph. It's a superimposition of multiple media and multiple temporal registers simultaneously, right? So it's an image of both the past and the future, um, as and her utterance um, layers the present with that, right? That she is in a moment of observing um, through her past hand an image of her future self. Um, so what I argue in that chapter um, is a sort of twofold um, set of claims about how historical drama does exactly what I've just described. It superimposes um, past, present, and future. Um, through the body of the actor, but that also the Henry IV plays have embedded within them 
um, further double exposures that do this same operation. So if, as I said already, an actor um, is a, a, histor- a scene from a history play is a double exposure where um, we are seeing simultaneously the present body of the actor and the past um, figure who is being represented through the actor, we are also seeing the future um, insofar as a scripted play is a, a predictive um, mechanism that that scripts future events that look like this one, right? Not identical, perhaps, but like. Um, so that's how historical drama works. And then, um, as I argue, within a play like Henry IV, um, those kinds of phenomena are repeatedly um, produced. So one example, a really simple one, um, is that Falstaff conscripts a group of soldiers. Um, and because he has bribed, he's been bribed to let the more able-bodied um, men um, off, off the hook, um, the soldiers he's conscripted are pretty decrepit. Um, and he describes them as dead men, he's stolen from the gibbets. He's taken these corpses off the gibbets, uh, you know, from the hangman and conscripted them into service and that they're going to go on to be food for powder, to be killed in war. So they are dead men who are being reanimated in order to become dead men again. Um, And in that image, we have, I argue, this kind of double exposure where we're invited to see the living person um, as superimposed with his or her own spectral self, who is both past and future, that the spectral self is always already present and always the future of that self. So another version of this is Falstaff's own fake death, where he stages a preview of his corpse, of his own corpse. Um, And so there again, um, there's the sort of historical figure of John Falstaff, who's being enacted. I mean, we could talk at length about the the relationship, right, between um, the historical John Falstaff and the the character in Shakespeare's play. Um, But the the pretense of a history play is that this is a historical person, right? So that Falstaff um, represents there both the the prior dead person um, who is being figured in the living body of the actor, um, the future death of Falstaff, who will meet his demise in early in Henry V, um, but also the way in which those past and future dead selves are superimposed on the body that lays on stage as a prefiguration or um, impersonation of its own corpse. So um, I use in that chapter Derrida's concept of hauntology um, and his discussion of the specter to talk about how the living body is always inhabited by its spectral other, its spectral double, and that that spectral double is is a figure um, from who comes from the past and the future sort of simultaneously. Um, and therefore also complicates our notions of linear time, um, because here we have a a figure on stage who sort of represents past, present, and future simultaneously, um, but also complicates the ontological distinctions between dead and alive. Yeah, that is a great reading. I I know it's not a term that you use, but I walked away thinking, you know, Falstaff's zombie army. Yeah. It was a wonderfully, yeah, Yeah. wonderful reading of the passage. Um, Hotspur had, there is a, a, in To Henry IV, um, his army, as they're described after the battle in which they're killed, arrive to the battle as already dead people, zombies. Um, 
And I, I think one might argue, or you know, maybe Derrida would argue that we're all part of a zombie army, <laughs> um, or that there is no other kind of army, that there is only ever the zombie army because of the spectral inhabitation of the living self by its um, by the by the dead. The images in this book are startling. From 19th century photographs of Mary Todd Lincoln with the specter of her dead husband, uh, presumably hanging over her shoulders, to Jeff Wall's 1992 uh, photograph, Dead Troops Talk. How should a reader use this book as a self-aware intermedial artifact itself? Or how do we do things with how to do things with dead people? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, I guess my answer is that I don't I don't really want to tell people how to do anything. <laughs> um, what I want to do, what I want this book to be is an invitation and an enabling um, sort of um, generative object um, to think with and but but also to feel with. So I guess a more direct answer to your question is to say that um this book came to a significant degree out of my um, interest uh, in trusting my own intuitions as a scholar, but also as a, a, an audience, an, a, an audience in a theater seeing those plays in Stratford, um, an audience in an art gallery, an audience at the Guggenheim. Um, and so the book is in many ways an invitation to my colleagues um, and future students, uh, you know, and anyone who um, who ends up reading it to um, react um, and to feel and to trust and do something with even just follow the thought if that's the the something that's done with one's own experience of the the images um, that those the experience of the image the experience for example of feeling like um, that that sculpture turned into an x-ray turned into a photograph on the cover of the book is looking at me what do I do with that? How can I do something with that? If I take that seriously, that experience of being looked at by a thing that was made centuries ago and has been reproduced in multiple forms that distance me from the original object, um, if I experience that as looking back at me, what, what can I do with that experience? And how can I turn that into um, a critical practice that takes seriously my own intuitions and impulses? Um, so, yeah, I, I really want to enable um, my readers, other scholars, my students to, um, to authorize their own responses and use those responses to to make to create um, ways of thinking that that we come to through our encounters with art um, and literature and drama um, and and to make new things with that so that's what to do to do what do what where it you know, sort of where it leads you um, and take seriously the the invitation to go with it. Let's talk about your chapter uh, on Richard III. Yeah. Um, which in some ways fulfills, you know, those that invitation as you describe it. Um, you, you describe Richard III as kind of a, a, a glitch in the, mm. a glitch body in the, that performs a glitch in the king machine, the sort of reproduction of kingship. Um, can you uh, sort of spell out your argument a little more? Yes. Um, I work some with um, glitch art, which I didn't know existed until um, I was kind of halfway through that chapter and was using the word glitch, um, but didn't know that it was a thing. So I'm indebted to Rebecca Bushnell um, for pointing me in that direction. And Gina Bloom also helped me think about glitch art and taught me that glitch art was a thing. Um, glitch art is 
an art it's a it's an art form um whereby creators um exploit um the programming that is that makes something run properly um and use aspects of the programming um, to make new things. So, for example, if you just think about a computer image and how it is a set of pixels, right, that um, are brought into the coherence of image through the technological artifice of continuity, and what the experience of something becoming pixelated, that it breaks apart, um, that breaking apart is glitching, and the capacity to break apart is written into the code that also makes it coherent. So the coherence and the glitchiness or incoherence cohabitate that code. They are both there. Um, so what I argue about Richard III is that although he is described by other people in the plays um, as a kind of mistake, an error, a glitch, that his glitchiness is um, like the pixelation possibility um, embedded in the coding. It's embedded in the coding for genetic reproduction. Genetic reproduction is not a perfect system. Um, It's a system that produces difference not a system that produces sameness. And um, this is something that Lee Edelman helps us to see, I think, through queer theory. Um, But that that if we think about a figure of Richard II, uh, I'm sorry, the figure of Richard III in relation to a concept like glitchiness, we can see that hereditary reproduction is a system for fantasizing the reproduction of sameness of clones, Richard II, Richard III, Richard IV, Henry II, all right, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. Um, but that it is, in fact, a system that produces as much glitch, as much error, as much noise and um, aberration as similarity, and that the history plays expose both of those operations. They they expose the fantasy of cloning, of wishing to reproduce, of wishing that Henry VI were like Henry V, Um, and they also expose um, the, the inbuilt failure systems that hereditary reproduction and genealogical succession wish to cover over sort of fantasize out of existence, but can't quite get rid of. So that's how I use the concept of the glitch. And again, it's it. I use it, um, I come to it from sort of out of Richard through technology and then back into the plays. Your epigraph is um, quite unusual for an academic monograph. You talk about, you dedicate the book to your son, Adam, and you talk in the epigraph about uh, how Adam um, wanted the book to be dedicated to him, but you thought this was a somewhat um, perverse choice. Um, and you include several photographs of Adam dressed as different figures in the book. Um, Andy Warhol, um, David Bowie as uh, Ziggy Stardust, I think. Um, can you talk about the intersection of the personal and um, sort of why uh, you chose to end the book? Um, with a kind of personal exploration? Sure. Um, it's a, it's a, that was really hard to, to write that, that part of the book. Um, and mainly because I could feel where I wanted it to go. And I, I knew that um, it made sense to me to write about my son who had been dressing up as people I was writing about uh, during, you know, for Halloween and school projects during the course of my work on this book. Um, and so it made sense to go there. It was also really difficult because it feels like a risk. Um, we don't often do that in academic books. Um, and it did feel morbid um, to put my child in a book called how to do things with dead people. Um, he, as you noted, he, he wanted the book to be dedicated to him. And, 
um, I, I really had to, I struggled with that. I struggled with it and, um, and ultimately decided to just kind of move toward that. And it was in the drafting of the epilogue that I came to the decision that I would do what he was asking me to do, that I would dedicate the book to him. Um, and I think the reason that the, that the book takes that turn, that the epilogue becomes personal is because um, it is, it always is um, for so many reasons. We write about the things um, as scholars, you know, that are um, deeply compelling to us, but also about, I think, the mysteries, right? The things that we are most curious about and um, the questions that we want answered. And um, I, death is uh, perhaps the deepest mystery um, of human existence or, or, you know, animal existence, any existence, maybe. Um, and um, there are ways in which I think um, our conversations about history um, don't invite um, that mystery in, um, seek to um, partition the past from the present and um, treat the past as a as something that has closed. Um, and the book argues in many ways that that's not the case. Um, and so it's in a way, even before it gets to the personal, it's really thinking about what we are doing all the time with the dead. Um, because as scholars of really modern literature, that's what we're doing, right? We're perseverating over the dead. We're processing the dead. We're doing things with and to the dead. Um, and so I, I wanted to think about the implications of that for life, really, for what it means then to be living um, and what it means really to, to go back as we do over and over and reproduce and think about and ultimately, I think, with and through the dead. Um, and so, I, you know, I was curious about what my son was doing when he dressed up as David Bowie and Andy Warhol um, and how that gesture was ultimately a gesture of love for me um, and what that meant then, right, that we can use the dead to love each other, uh, which is a sort of mind-blowing concept um, and not not how as historicists, you know, trained to think um, about the past, not really how we process them, process the dead. And so um, in the face of those gestures that he was making, I, I kind of wanted to, again, sort of as I was suggesting earlier, take seriously um, what he was up to and, um, and how um, that reflected on what I was up to um, in this project and to, to, to um, try to find a way to talk honestly about that. Um, so that's what, what the epilogue attempts to do. Do you teach the material in the book? Um, and how has teaching influenced your thinking and writing? Uh, well, I, I started to, I started to teach the history plays almost as soon as I got back from that, the trip where, you know, to England, where I saw the Boyd cycle because I was riveted and, um, and a, a total junkie really for the history plays after that. Um, and my teaching of the plays, um, has evolved significantly since then. Um, at the point when I discovered Warhol's electric chairs and knew that I wanted to move the book toward, that chair and work out what it had to do with the history plays. I started to use it in the classroom. Um, and I didn't know really what I was doing. I have to admit, I, I um, you know, I was teaching a course on just the histories. I taught eight, eight plays in one semester, which is a pretty forced march for students. It's a lot. They think they're signing up for a Shakespeare class, and then you come in, and you're trying to explain um, all these Henrys and Richards to them. You know, it's pretty daunting. And 
um, I, I think not terribly appealing on that first day of class when they realize what they've gotten themselves into. So I started to, on the very first day of class, I would show them uh, some Warholian electric chairs and just do a kind of open thought experiment with them um, to ask what they saw and how what they were seeing might um, be um, a, a theory of history. Um, and I can't say that we generated the most, you know, um, brilliant answers. It was, it was experimental. Uh, I, I didn't, I didn't know the answers myself at that time. I just had, again, sort of the intuition and the impulse to do it. Um, but I did find that sort of forcing myself to <laughs> think with other people, using that image, those images, um, may, it was a kind of discipline. It was a kind of, um, way of disciplining myself toward, um, the eventual very serious engagement. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, with the, with those images. Um, so it, it worked on me that way. Um, and then, you know, as the project developed, I would from time to time bring other things in. And I now teach a component of our graduate theory course that's based on um, some of the work with um, the Jeff Wall image, Dead Troops Talk, um, with the Alexander Gardner portrait of Louis Payne. So I use those images now mostly to teach theory. Um, to teach aspects of performance theory in particular. And last question. Um, I know this book is fresh off the press, but have you given thought to what your next project might be? Yes, I have two things I'm working on at present. Um, one is a, a, it's one of these, you know, it didn't make it into the book, um, but it's um, kind of the, the final um, piece that I feel right now that I want to write about on this topic. And it has to do with um, video game modding. Um, so apparently I am learning. Um, there are, um, there's a significant energy in the gaming community around um, modification of, of corpses that um some gamers don't like the way corpses behave in video games. And you can tell this, I'm very early into this because I don't have a, a really a fluid way of talking about it. Um, and so they create modifications. They do what's called modding um, so that the corpses in the game behave the way that they want them to behave, which either means that they disappear or that they don't disappear, that they stay stick around um, or that they can be buried or mourned in some ritual way that is scripted or programmed by the modification. Um, so I'm going to be working on um, a short piece that's about corpse modding essentially and um Henry V um, and the treatment of corpses in Henry V and probably also um, the Welsh women um, who are desecrating corpses at the beginning of, um, I'm forgetting which play that is now, um, to Henry IV, I believe. Or um, maybe, yes, um, one Henry IV, one of the Henry IV plays. <laughs> um, so I'm working on that. Um, that's a small thing. And I, have um, accepted an invitation to edit um, the Arden Shakespeare's fourth series edition of Measure for Measure. Um, so I have begun work on that. Um, it's a brand new skill set for me, um, but a play I I find deeply weird and fascinating. Um, it, it will, my edition will bring together, of course, my work in death studies, but also um, religious studies. Um, and um, as a feminist scholar to produce what I hope will be an exciting edition that speaks to um, the, the moment we find ourselves in, um, particularly with regard to um, consent. So lots to lots to do there. It's a many year project that I am only at the start of, but that is the big thing that I'll be doing next. Yeah, both of those projects sound uh, really exciting. We'll keep our eyes out for them. Um, thank you for joining us today, Alice. 
Thank you, John. This was such a pleasure. I appreciate it.